If you've been following any of the stories over the past several years about the movement of hundreds of thousands, millions of people illegally into the United States, you may have come across the phrase Darien Gap. And it's never really explained what it is. It's a physical place. It's between Panama and Colombia. And it is a gap in the Pan-American Highway. In other words, if you want to get from South America to North America overland, you have to go through the Darien Gap. But it's very difficult. And yet, last year, at least 520,000 migrants crossed it to come here. How did that happen? What is it? What is going on in the Darien Gap? It's the key, in some ways, to the story, this immigration story. Well, almost no one has taken the time to go to the Darien Gap and find out what's happening there. Leave it to a world around biologist to do that, not a journalist, a biologist. That would be Dr. Brett Weinstein, who is the host, along with his wife, Heather, of the Dark Horse podcast. And he was just there last week because he wanted to see it for himself. We're honored to have him join us now to tell us what he found. Dr. Weinstein, thank you so much. Very good to be back with you, Tucker. So can you, that was my feeble attempt to ad lib an explanation of the Darien Gap, but can you, can you a little more precisely tell us what it is? Sure. Uh, you did a pretty good job. The Pan American Highway is a road that literally goes from Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, to the southern tip of South America. It is unbroken, but for a 60-mile stretch uh, between Panama and Colombia. It is not a canyon, as many people imagine the gap must be. It's an impenetrable piece of jungle, and the road has never been completed there, not because it's technically impossible to do, but because the combination of the difficulty of putting a road through that jungle and the the danger of doing so has meant that North and South America have been separated in this way uh, for the entire history of that road. So you often hear people say it's a perilous journey to get across that 60 miles of the Darien Gap. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, it's beyond fair. Let's just say uh, I did my graduate work uh, not far from Darien. I did it in, in central Panama. And the jungle in the Darien Gap is some place that one um, does not go without careful preparation. It is uh, quite dangerous. It involves a number of conditions that make it perilous. For one thing, the Cordillera, which is the mountain range that is effectively the continental divide, the same continental divide that we see in Colorado, for example, continues down through Central America and it passes through Darien. So imagine a very uh, difficult jungle without proper trails through it in which migrants have to come up that mountain range and they're almost all unprepared. They don't have the kinds of materials you would want with you. So they're soaking wet from rain. They're sleeping on the ground. And so they get hypothermia. Um, it's extremely slippery. So people are constantly sliding down hills, breaking limbs. They sleep in their shoes and get trench foot. It's a very treacherous uh, journey. And the difficulty of it should not be underrated. So how did, I mean, you wonder why there's not a permanent team of New York Times reporters there trying to tell the rest of us what exactly is happening. If half a million people move through there in one year. How did you wind up there? Well, I, I wound up there because Michael Yan had been sending me materials, uh, thinking that I would be interested in what was taking place in Panama. And of course, I was utterly fascinated by what I was seeing. Now, some of your viewers may not know Michael. Michael is a former Green Beret who has refashioned himself. Well, the last time I was on your program, I talked about Goliath. Yes. And uh, if there's a Goliath, there's a David. And I would argue that Michael Yan is like David's eyes. He's been traversing the world trying to understand a story that as yet has no name. And that story is partially in the Darien of Panama, and it's all sorts of other places, including uh, in various UN installations. There, there's some story that is uh, difficult to piece together, and he's been, he's been um, physically traveling to all of its various epicenters and showing people. So, And that is the story of mass migration. Uh, mass migration, I now think, is a piece of it. Now, when I went to Panama, I had a hard time explaining to myself why I was going because... Those are the best trips, aren't they? They, yes. <laughs> they, they, they are. The serendipity of it is is important. But it was hard for me to justify in my head going to such a place when it wasn't going to change 
you know, the, the videos he had sent me were quite clear. Um, so what was it I was going to learn by standing there that I couldn't also learn by looking at these things? Well, I'm very glad I went because it did actually radically change my understanding of what I was looking at for reasons I better understand now. Um, it, one needs to see the, uh, the physical relationship between the various sites that he showed us um, in order to really piece together what this story is. So you went, if I can summarize what I think you're saying, because you're a researcher and you wanted to know what's actually happening. Uh, the thing that gets de-emphasized when we talk about um, high quality science is the degree to which it is f informed by well-tutored intuition. So I had a sense that I needed to see it for reasons that my conscious mind wasn't certain of at the time. And I followed that and I'm, I'm very glad I did. Follow your instincts. Boy, that is, that is the lesson of so many moments in life. So what did you find and what did you conclude? Well, uh, I concluded a number of things and, and the whole thing was so um, mentally disruptive that I, I'm still in the process of unpacking what it was and debating with myself about what it means. But uh, I'll give you um, some basics. But I, I do have to ask something of your audience. There's part of this that is just me reporting what I saw and what I learned from Michael and others on our trip. And there's part of it that's me speculating. And I'm trying to do it as responsibly as possible because a great deal hinges on what the actual explanation for what, what we looked at is. So when I'm speculating, I'm going to be careful to tell you that that's what I'm doing and people should you know, treat hypotheses as hypotheses um, and, and nothing more. But the first place that this trip really changed my understanding was I went down thinking that I was going to see a migration. And other people have called it an invasion. And there is something troubling to me about the tension between these two things. I mean, which is it? And I came away with the sense that it's probably literally both. And the way that manifests is you have a massive movement of people through the Darien from Colombia. Now, I did not know when I went down. I now know that most of those people actually start in Ecuador. And the reason they start in Ecuador is that Ecuador has a policy where they don't require a visa. So people coming from all over the world can land in Quito, Ecuador, find their way through Colombia, move through the Darien, and if they survive it, which not all of them do, they can then get relatively directly all the way through Central America into the U.S. But that's not all that's going on. So we went to several of the, I guess you would call them, transit camps. These are places where people who have come by whatever route to Darien, where they uh, recover if they're injured, and they have to accumulate money because even if they settle out on their journey with enough money to buy a bus ticket to get them through Central America, by the time they've come through Darien, almost all of them have been robbed. And much worse, actually. People are being robbed. Women are being raped. Um, and lots of people are dying. The migrants talk about stepping over bodies in Darien and for somebody with experience in these kinds of jungles, it's not hard to see how, without a support network, the kinds of stuff that can happen in a jungle can become uh, deadly very quickly. Things can spiral out of control. So you have all of these migrants from all over the world. Many of them are South American, but that is by no means the whole story. People are coming from the Middle East. We met Afghans. We met people from the Caribbean, Haitians. There are people from Yemen, Iran. It's shocking, really. This looks superficially like the migration of Central Americans that you and I remember from when we were kids. Yes. And there is some of that, um, but that's not the whole story. Now, in um, there's a camp we went to called Canaan Membrio. It's on the Canaan River at the town of Membrio. And Canaan Membrio, we were allowed to walk around at will, and we could interact with the migrants. Um, at will. We were allowed to take pictures. There was no concern about this. We just had to check in with the Senna Front. The Senna Front is the Panamanian Border Authority. But once we had checked in 
Uh, we were on our own. And people were interested in talking, including migrants. So we had many conversations with migrants. And these migrants, I, I have to tell you, when they come to the southern border of the U.S., um, they get through on the basis that they are political refugees. They aren't. When we talk to them in the transit camp, everybody tells the same story. They are fleeing um, economic collapse, and they are fleeing in the direction of what they perceive to be economic opportunity. And of course, in American law, these two things are very different. We protect people who are seeking political asylum, but we do not offer automatic economic asylum. And the reason for that is fairly clear, which is that in order to protect people economically, we end up robbing Americans of their economic well-being. And we, that's just not something that people are entitled to, no matter how much compassion you may have right. for people fleeing Venezuela. It is not... Um, our responsibility, especially not without some sort of a plan and agreement about how many people are going to come through and in what way we're going to take care of them and how that's going to get paid for, um, we, we, don't, uh, we don't do that. But in any case, you, you get the same story from everybody. They're, they're fleeing uh, an economic crisis and they're moving um, north and many of them have terrible stories about what happened to them in the Darien Gap. So that's... Uh, one thing, and you see, if, when you go into this, this camp, Kanam Embryo, you see the hallmark of the international community. You see NGO emblems all over the place, proudly American flags. They've paid for the water system, the, the toilets that are there. The United States government is facilitating this economic migration, and it's unmistakable, as is an organization called the IOM which is the International Organization for Migration. It's a branch of the UN. And if you read their, their charter, you will discover that this organization believes that migration is an inherently good thing, that it's always good. And so they see it as their job to bring it about, to facilitate it. And in this case, that's particularly tragic because their uh, desire to induce people to migrate is causing people who are woefully unprepared for the Darien Gap to try to make that journey. And um, the, the humanitarian tragedy is, is immense. So the UN, of which the United States is, I think, the largest donor by far, mm -hmm. is paying for this with the U.S. government. Uh, apparently they are. Now, Panamanians are largely unaware. Some are aware that there's a migration, but in large measure, this migration, once it gets through the Darien Gap, boards buses, and effectively what I now understand is that all of the countries in Central America are effectively waving the migrants through because those migrants are not going to stop in these countries. As long as they keep going to the U.S., these countries are willing to remain silent about it. Now, in 1991, Heather and I actually traveled the other direction through Central America, through all of the countries south to uh, to Costa Rica. And all of those borders are tightly controlled. Oh, I've been, yeah. Um, and so it is very surprising to find those controls are effectively lifted here. That's clearly the result of a massive coordination. And um, of course, it's resulting in a large migration. But what I was going to tell you about the fact that this migration doesn't appear to me to be just one thing, is that we went to another camp called San Vicente. And everything in San Vicente is different than it was at Canaan Mambrio. San Vicente, first of all, it's not a town. This is a camp that is built as a transit camp. It's built of containers and various objects to house people. And it is almost entirely Chinese. Now, there were Chinese folks. Chinese? Chinese. That's a long way from China. It sure is. And what's more, in this camp, the rule that you're able to go in and walk around and talk to people is not in evidence. The Cenefront, the Panamanian border control, actually forbid us to go into the camp. So we had to stay on the outside of it. We were also forbidden to photograph it. So what photographs we have were uh, 
taken covertly. Um, but the most striking thing. Wait, may I ask this? So is it the government of China? Do you believe that's funding this? I, well, let me tell you the other thing I found, and then I think the answer to that will become clearer. Outside of the San Vicente camp, the Chinese migrants are, um, you can interact with them. There are a couple of shops where they go to buy water or snacks or whatever. And so you can interact with them at those places. They are the opposite of forthcoming. They have no interest in talking to outsiders. And I've been to dangerous places before. I've been to places where people fear their government and can't talk to you because they feel it's not safe. This didn't feel like that at all. This felt like people who did not want to share information because it would be a mistake to do so. And what's more, there was an incident where Michael, who has lived in China, he's been all over the world, and he started up or tried to start up a conversation with uh, a guy who claimed to be from Korea. And Michael tripped him up and got him to speak Chinese. And then there was uproarious laughter at the fact um, that he had tried to pull this caper on Michael. So it is not a friendly migration. These uh, Chinese folks who are overwhelmingly male, military age, there are women present. I realized only this morning that in thinking back, I saw few, if any, children in the Chinese migration. They were everywhere in the other places we visited, but they were not present, as far as I remember, in the, in the San Vicente camp. So what I have pieced together, and this is a place where I'm going to speculate. This is a hypothesis. This is not a conclusion. But what I began to suspect was that the Chinese migration is actually being cloaked by the economic migration coming from South America. And that that um, is consistent with the observation that it has some different motivation. Now, I learned from Michael that the Chinese migrants in the San Vicente camp largely bypassed the Darien. They, because they have money, they, they can go by boat and they can skip most of the peril of the Darien Gap. And uh, in any case, it's a very different phenomenon. And to see it housed so separately is quite conspicuous. I do not know what the rationale for this Can you would estimate, be. do you have any sense of how many Chinese, these are Chinese nationals? They seem to be. How many did you see ish? <sighs> Talking 60 or 600 or? It's very hard to say because we were held at one edge of the camp. So I probably saw 150 faces, but the camp wow. is deeper. Now, Michael does some drone reconnaissance, and he's also been to this camp many times. Um, he would definitely be the person to ask in terms of a, a good estimate for how many of these folks there are. But um, the, the degree to which this is not consistent with a... Well, let me back up a second. I regard the Chinese people as victims of an oppressive government that I fear for my own reasons. For sure. So I, there's nothing about the fact that these folks are Chinese that throws me. And if they were fleeing that government, um, I'm not sure what we should do about it, but I'm certainly supportive of their you desire. Would sympathy, I sure. would feel a great deal of sympathy. And in fact, I felt a great deal of sympathy for all of the other migrants um, that I met. But the sense of, it's really hard not to use the term hostility that I felt from the Chinese was particularly unsettling given that I know where they're headed, right? They're headed to the U.S. And j just to be totally clear on that point, this was not a, a work camp for a, you know, Chinese infrastructure project. And... No, it, it, it was not. And um, what I know is taking place at the southern border of the U.S., um, 
makes this even more disturbing because although the controls at the southern border are still there for those of us who are crossing legally, the lack of any control for those who are crossing um, illegally is stunning. So if I may just compare, when I came back from Panama, I approached a kiosk with my passport ready to scan it. I didn't have to. A camera took my picture. And although I didn't know that my picture was about to be taken, I hadn't taken my hat off, I was wearing my glasses, um, the kiosk told me I didn't need to put my passport there. And then a customs officer behind me called my name, Brett. He said, do you have anything to declare? I said, no. He said, you're good to go. So we have technology that is capable of identifying a person um, with that level of ease to the point that they knew exactly who was coming through the border. But we are not apparently taking that information when people cross our southern border. What we're doing at most is asking them their name and their birth date and taking them at their word. But no biometric collection? Apparently not. Which means that, you know, even if this were simply a matter of our system being overwhelmed by migrants, you would at least want to collect that information so that if a troublemaker did come through, which is inevitable that they will, you could begin to figure out who it might be, right? So that, you know, they had an identity, even, even if it was just connected to biometric data, that would be useful, but we're not doing it. So um, what I think I saw, my hypothesis for what I think I saw is that there is an invasion taking place. You know, it's, it's not a sleeper cell because it's on the move, but I started to think of them as sleepwalkers. And there's also a massive migration, and the migration is causing, it, is causing us to have difficulty discussing the invasion, which is a distinct phenomenon. And, and different simply from desperate peasants from poor countries coming here for work. There was no desperation in evidence. And um, Michael also gave us a video, which I can't establish the origin of, but it, it is a Chinese cartoon uh, set to happy music of a migrant moving through Central America, changing modes of transportation. And it basically indicates here's the route you will travel. Now, was it produced by the CCP? I can't be certain of that, but that certainly is suggested that this is a, uh, a message about um, how to make this journey for what purpose, I don't know. But I do not believe that the people I encountered had left China without the knowledge of their government. I believe their government has some reason to, uh, to have facilitated. But the administration must be aware of this. Our administration? Yes. It is, but here's the problem I've been wrestling with. It used to be that it was hard to convince people that our system was deeply corrupt. Back in the days when those of us who were focused on this issue used to talk about campaign finance reform, right? right? It, was a, it was a problem you know, that you could grapple with. It was of that scale. Now we have, it's like a whole different level of corruption, right? And here's the question that I've never heard a good answer to. What stops our enemies internationally from buying influence over our system in the same way that corporations do and did. I can't think of anything, and I've never heard Patriotism? Of... <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry, just kidding. <laughs> um, I don't think there is any such safeguard. And if there is such a safeguard, I would like to know how often it has been triggered. Certainly, our enemies will have noticed that we have a system that's pay for play, and it's certainly, I mean, it's perfectly in keeping with Sun Tzu, at the very least, it would be far cheaper, easier, safer from their perspective to um, persuade us to harm ourselves than to go to war with us. So uh, again, I don't know. I'm, I'm a biologist. I'm, you know, this is not my... Well, you're an observer of things. That's what the study I... of biology is, right? It is, and unfortunately, this is the most parsimonious explanation for what I've seen now, is that somebody has persuaded us to um, endorse a policy that is decidedly not in our interest. And I will also say that um, I've become aware in the process of doing this 
that the Chinese have a, a rather famous plan for the world called the Belt and Road Initiative, yes. um, in which they have scoped out where the resources are and how they're to get from one place to another. What many people who know about the Belt and Road Initiative don't know is that they have also, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative is largely about Africa and Asia. Yes. But apparently there's been a considerable amount of thinking in China about how Belt and Road would work in the New World as well. And, and it's in full operation. I mean, St. Croix, which is an American protectorate, St. Croix next to, you know, the it's American Virgin Islands. Its road system is built by China. There you go. And there's an awful lot of investment in Panama. And there is certainly talk in China about opening the Darien Gap. Which opening it, paving it. Paving it, right. And another thing that Michael showed us, which I... I, it's maybe the most surprising thing I saw, is a bridge building project at Yavitsa, which is the town at the very end of the Pan American Highway in Darien. So there is a massive bridge being built. Not a bamboo and vine bridge. Oh no, this is a massive concrete and steel highway bridge um, being built over the Chukanake River into the Darien. What's on the other side is impenetrable jungle and a few villages. This bridge does not make any sense. So do you any idea who's paying for that? Um, that is much less clear. There are no signs. Most people in Panama are completely unaware that any such project exists. Um, there are no proud signs as there are in the transit camps. Um, I will say we spoke to the foreman of the project. I mean, the project is actually pretty impressive. You know, it's a construction site. Nobody's standing around. They are building a bridge, and they are uh, doing so uh, impressively. Do the workers seem to be local Panamanians? They do. Um, the foreman was Panamanian, and we asked him what the purpose of the bridge was. And he didn't know, but he speculated that it was to bring yucca from... Darien from the villages on the other side <laughs> into Panama. That's a that's a low margin agricultural product for those who are watching. It uh, doesn't justify a steel reinforced bridge yeah, across it, a river. It's it. The, there's nothing about this that makes any sense. I mean, yucca it's it's like a potato. Yeah. Um, it grows all over Panama, indeed, all over the world's tropics. Um, there would be no reason to grow it in Darien. In fact, there are very good reasons not to encourage more of it to be grown in Darien, given the priceless habitat that will be cleared to grow yucca there for no good reason. There's lots of better places to do it. So what I was left with is the sense that um, there's a bridge going in and it has a purpose that has not been shared with the Panamanians. That purpose really has to be, as far as I can tell, it's got to be one of two things. Either this is about bringing lumber out of Darien National Park, which would yes. be obscene. Cutting hardwood. Cutting hardwood. These, this is priceless hardwood yep. um, that is in part still standing because it is such a difficult jungle to access. So it's possible that somebody has targeted that wood and not told the Panamanians and um, they're building this bridge for that purpose. But the other potential purpose is that they're intending to finish the Pan American Highway through Darien, um, which is something that would certainly need to be discussed to be reasonable. Now, in the aftermath of our trip, um, Anne Vandersteel put up a video sharing uh, just a view of this construction site and her perspective on it. And this caused a, a small scandal in Panama because the Panamanians weren't aware and suddenly this was on the internet and they were talking about what is this bridge at the southern end of, uh, of, of the uh, Pan American Highway in Panama. And the Panamanians claimed that it was just to reach the villages on the other side. So I'm left with the very odd sense that their cover story is that this is a boondoggle, right? If this was a boondoggle and they were just putting right. money into a project that meant nothing, then that would explain the bridge to nowhere. But this didn't look like a boondoggle. This looked like somebody wanted the bridge and 
given the Belt and Road Initiative and the sense that the Chinese have about what the future should look like and in which direction resources should move and for what purpose, it's hard for me not to connect the dots between these things, right? You have a massive migration of people, labor. You have a likely invasion of military age, largely Chinese males uh, who are not forthcoming about why they have embarked on their journey and appear to be encouraged by something in China to do this. So, you know, I don't know. Is there... G given what you're describing and what you saw with your own eyes, uh, doubtless you have seen Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois' comments in the Senate where he said, hey, we should let people who came here illegally join the U.S. military. What, what does that make you think? Well... This makes me think back to the COVID crisis and some thoughts that I was developing then about the insanity of throwing highly trained people in many cases out of the U.S. military for refusing to take the so-called vaccines. Now, my sense at the time was that that likely had the purpose of getting rid of the kinds of people who refuse yes. moral orders. That's right. And that it created a much more compliant force. Now, what happens if migrants are given citizenship in exchange for military service in the U.S. military? That seems to create a major hazard because the perverse incentives for a migrant and the lack of allegiance to fundamental American values means that that would be just the kind of force that could be used to impose tyranny on other Americans because, yes. uh, because they would have you know, no history with us that would cause them to think twice. We, we've seen this before with the Roman legions. Um, that's exactly my conclusion. Um, does that sound like a crazy conclusion? Uh, I think we have to stop punishing ourselves for considering things that once seemed crazy. That the pattern of recent <laughs> history. I'm sorry, can I, I want to repeat that. I think we have to stop punishing ourselves for considering things that once seemed crazy. Yep. Getting that tattoo. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, th th this is where we are. And it, it is, um, it's causing me to do something that I'm reluctant to do. My, my training is as a scientist and scientists um, have to have a, a substantial degree of caution and self-skepticism yes. to do the work. But in order even to reach the possibilities that do fully explain what we're seeing, we have to be ready to consider, um, consider the larger picture. Now, I was talking to Chris Martinson uh, while we were in Panama. We were on our last day trying to just unpack what we had seen and what it meant to us. Um, Chris is also a scientist. And people can check this out on uh, the Dark Horse Locals community. Um, we've posted the entire conversation in which he and I reached some, I think we spooked ourselves um, trying to reason through what this, this might be. And he reminded me of the a massive number of surplus males that China now has as a result. I was thinking the exact same thing as a result of the one one child policy. The one child policy. Now, here's the part that I uh, suddenly realized as soon as he reminded me of that. I wrote an essay years ago about the one child policy and the paradox of a heavy bias in favor of males. And the reason that this is a paradox is that there's a principle in evolution well understood. It's the result of the work of a guy named Ronald Fisher. And what Fisher realized was that although males and females can be very different in how many offspring they produce, and because a male could produce thousands of offspring in a lifetime and a female, if we're talking about humans, could, I think the maximum is something impressive like 60, but um, nonetheless, because males can produce a lot more, it seems that it might be evolutionarily advantageous to be one. But it's not because for every overperforming male, there's an underperforming right. male or at least one. And the result is that sex ratios 
no matter how different males and females are in their maximum reproductive capacity, they tend to default to one to one. If you have a society that has too many females, you should produce a male. And if you have a society with too many males, you should produce a female, which tends to balance these things out. That logic should have applied to China. The fact is there were lots of excess males. And if you put yourself in the mindset of a Chinese person having a child, if there are too many males, you should want to produce a female. A male is very unlikely to find a mate. A female is certain to find one. And what's more, she has her pick of the litter. Yes. So that logic should have caused the sex ratio to return to 50-50, and yet it did not, which caused me all those years ago when I wrote this piece to wonder if there wasn't another evolutionary force in play. If evolution did not have a mechanism for producing armies, that when a, a country was in a position to expand, that producing excess males does pay off at a lineage level, that excess males who have no reproductive prospects at home become an effective weapon against neighboring populations. So I can't believe that that did not occur to me as I was um, preparing for this trip, but uh, it has occurred to me now. I guess it didn't occur to me because when I wrote that all those years ago, I was expecting to see evidence that this was turning into a military force, and I didn't see it, so I stopped thinking about it. Um, but now I wonder if that isn't exactly right and if what happened is that um, a male-biased population in China was produced as a weapon, and if that weapon is now being deployed. That's remarkable. So that would, so, so far we have the U.S. government abetting this, a branch of the U.N., Chinese government. Did you see any other funders or apparent funders of this? Well, I'm not expert in this area at all. We did go to a place, so I, I guess I didn't say this, 25 years ago I worked in Panama. I lived on Barrow, Colorado Island, which is an island administered by the Smithsonian Institution in the Panama Canal. It was a hilltop that got isolated when the canal filled, and the Smithsonian took it over because it was a marvelous opportunity to have an isolated piece of forest that they could watch over time and learn how tropical biology works. So I had the privilege of living in the canal for 18 months, and I got very familiar with the canal. You zone. lived in the Panama Canal for 18 months. Absolutely did. We used to swim in the waters um, for whatever reason. The crocodiles that inhabit those waters, if we would encounter them while swimming, they would turn and go the other way, which was lovely. Apparently, that's no longer true, and you can't swim there. But um, yeah, I, I lived there. What, did the, you, what were you studying? Tent-making bats. Um, <laughs> I know that sounds... I, I'm only asking because I really for your benefit because I want you to remember just how dramatically your life has changed. Yeah. Well, I, I still love tent making bats. It's, really, <laughs> it's, it's, a little, it's a little miracle that exists in these forests. But anyway, maybe we'll talk about that another time. Um, but I, I was well familiar with the canal zone because we used to... The canal zone, in fact, the military, this was, this was before the handover to the Panamanians. So we, you know, the military made it possible for the Smithsonian to work there. And we were constantly interacting. We were going on their bases. We'd go on their bases to watch a movie. Um, so we were using this military infrastructure, which has now all been handed over to Panama. And what impressed me was when we went back specifically to Fort Clayton, something that is now called the City of Knowledge. The City of Knowledge is housed in uh, or its central building is the former Army South building from the U.S. Southern Command. So this is both an important fact for the military, that the U.S. Southern Command is a segment of the military dedicated to uh, protecting American interests in the Caribbean and all of Latin America south of Mexico. And it has this impressive structure in Fort Clayton, immediately uh, above the, um, the Las Flores locks. Um, so it was both physically there to protect the canal, and it was metaphorically this imposing presence looking out over... To project power south. Absolutely. And 
after the handover, all of the military bases that were in the canal zone were handed over. And this one has been taken over by the UN and the international community and all the NGOs have offices there. And it reminded me of how many things in our society have been had their purpose inverted, right? Universities used to exist to make young people uh, smarter and more analytically capable. Universities now make people stupider and convince them of things that just simply aren't true. Yes. Newspapers used to help us understand what the facts were about events that were taking place that involved us. Now newspapers obscure the facts from us. Um, they're the last to report the news after we embarrass them into doing it. So this structure that once uh, was a testament to the achievement of the Panama Canal and the importance of protecting the Panama Canal um, is now involved in what looks like obvious subterfuge against American interests, right? An organization that is dedicated to facilitating migration without asking Americans, without there being any plan at all for how uh, the well-being of these people is going to be financed, that their office, IOM, is sitting, if this building, U.S. Army South, at the Las Flores locks, um, is... Um, it's like a it's like a person and at that person's left knee is the IOM looking out at the bridge of the Americas which when I was there was the only way to cross the Panama Canal right it's almost the exact inversion of what this these structures were built for and uh, there, how many times do you have to see the inversion of something to begin to get the sense that that's something has taken over our system and it's it's become sick well, it's it's all, and I'm sure there's a biological uh, term to describe the process of well, maybe cancer, the body eating itself. I mean, it seems like the structures set in place to protect the country are now at war with the country. I do have the sense that um, the country, the structures, and it's not even just the country; it's the West. And you know, I view myself as very much a patriot of the country, but I'm also a patriot of the West, which I see the country as having, um, uh, it's, maybe it's slightly overstated to say uh, invented the concept, but, um, but in any case, yes, the West appears to be sick with an infection. And again, I don't want to drag you into too much biology, but um, everybody knows what a parasite is. There's also something called a parasitoid. And a parasito parasitoid is a parasite that kills its host in the process of doing its job. And I'm concerned that we may have a, a parasitoid that is actually um, at least indifferent to the destruction of the United States and the West and is acting accordingly. So I know it's become your life's work or part of your life's work to figure out what exactly that, <laughs> that entity is. Are you any closer? Um, I suppose I, I am. I mean, maybe I'm I'm part way, and and that part involves. I I now look at a map with much more skepticism that I understand what it means. That we have become so accustomed to looking at something like a nation, like China, and thinking of it as an entity that behaves in some way and something about the um, the ease with which various power structures interact suggests that we I don't understand why my government is behaving in a way that seems um, to be sabotaging the interests of average Americans but it is undeniably um, it seems to be acting on behalf of our enemies. I don't know whether that could conceivably be because uh, there's actually hostility. I doubt it. But my guess is what there is is just a, uh, a rampant outbreak of amorality where people are willing to do whatever is expedient. And that has made the game rather easy for um, powers that be elsewhere. 
And I don't know, I don't know where the analysis becomes absurd. I have watched policy on the West Coast make the quality of life drop spectacularly so that people are fleeing, including wealthy people. And I look at wealthy people fleeing California, for example, and I think something about this story doesn't add up. It's, it's rather a lot like building up a population with too many males. There's something else that explains this, because at the end of the day, wealthy elites are going to end up with the best real estate. So the fact that they're fleeing either means that which elites are going to end up with that real estate is about to switch. Maybe this was a, uh, a real estate scam. You know, Malibu will always be occupied by rich people. It will, but which rich people? Yes. And I wonder, you know, having seen something that very much looks like an undeclared invasion moving through Central America, knowing that the Chinese Communist Party thinks in terms of long-term planning over the movement of people and resources, that our system, uh, we've effectively opened the gates of the city to anybody who's willing to pay uh, to corrupt our political structures. There is a story you could tell in which the CCP has a different understanding of what the future of our country is than most Americans do. And, uh, well, let's just put it this way. Maybe I'm imagining what I saw, but if I'm not, then all of those Chinese migrants who don't want to talk about what they're doing moving into the U.S., they're going to do something. I don't know what it's going to be, but... Um, I don't know when we became so naive about the fact that we have, uh, there are parties abroad who do not wish us well and would not mind at all seeing us um, removed from our position of power. And who knows, maybe, you know, some of us are displaced from the continent we live on. I, I can't say. I mean, China is, is literally the other side of the world. It's also not Haiti. I mean, there's economic opportunity in China, and but there's also economic opportunity for unemployed Chinese in the Philippines or Vietnam, Malaysia. <laughs> it's not obvious that they would come to the Darien Gap to get here. Well, the Darien Gap is a very strange place to have gone. Um, for one thing, as Chris Martinson points out, the absurdity, if we're going to invite people in, let's say... Let's say we had decided that we, we didn't have enough people to do labor and that it was actually good for the U.S. to bring in large numbers of people from elsewhere. Having people go through the, the, the theater of marching through Darien is absurd and, and dangerous, and it, it is creating a humanitarian crisis in addition to the environmental crisis, which is in Darien. We're creating a humanitarian crisis that's absolutely needless. Either these people should be welcomed because it's good for us to bring right. them in, exactly. or they shouldn't be there at all. And the only purpose I can think, especially given that the Chinese, many of the Chinese, I don't want to say all, there are Chinese people in the other camps. We saw that as well. Also not forthcoming about anything. But um, the, the only purpose I can think of for coming to America via Panama is that it allows them to blend with all of the people who are coming from South America. It makes it hard to discuss, but I can't think of another reason to do it that way. It's, at the very least, wildly inefficient. Is, I mean, these are such interesting and important questions, but they're also rooted in your personal observation. Did you run into, into any journalists from big newspapers or TV channels when you were down there? Absolutely not. Um, which is also shocking. I mean, this is emblematic of the era we are living in, where the issues which obviously have our well-being tied up in them are hiding in plain sight. It's not hard to see this story. All you need to know is where to go. You can go look at it. And the fact that that's not happening, that our major news organizations are 
disinterested in this story, again, suggest a system that has been corrupted across the board. You would imagine that even if the New York Times didn't want to report this story, that some reporter with ambition would chase it down anyway. But so universal is the complicity here that nobody reports it. And if they do report it, they report it wrong. They report it so that it leads you to have a confused sense or a sense that this is more minor than it is. But we're talking literally about millions of people. And millions of people is not a minor issue, you know, in a country with 300 million, right? This is a major demographic shift one way or the other. Yeah, and a permanent one. Um, did you? What did you hear about the cartels when you were down there? We hear a lot about them in this country, but in pretty nonspecific terms. Um, we heard that they were present, and I don't think that's a new phenomenon. We also heard, so there's a lot of um, what we would call coyotes uh, at our southern border are called snakeheads. There's a lot of this going on in Darien. People are paying to have somebody shepherd them through, and that often does not go well. Um, so they're present. The cartels appear to be uh, making a great deal of money from this. They're probably not happy to have it discussed. I don't know what that implies. Um, but also, I would point out, the farther north this migration obviously has a relationship with the cartels. The cartels are largely about American demand for illicit substances. And a massive, uncontrolled wave of migrants is an obvious mechanism whereby fentanyl and other things are entering the U.S. in an unmonitored way. I mean, and in fact, to the extent that they come in with migrants, you know, we are apparently facilitating their transport into the interior. We're spreading them around. And um, so what I can say is, the cartels are not directly visible, visible to uh, a visitor, but their influence is felt and discussed. You're describing a lot of different crimes happening simultaneously. Yep. What's the solution? Well, I mean, it, and strangely, it goes back to the idea of giving ourselves permission to entertain all kinds of possibilities, even things that are crazy and we have to ultimately reject. But we have to, um, we have to not talk ourselves out of noticing what is taking That's a place. scientific principle, is it not? Well, you know, it's funny. Scientists don't, scientists are losing their way as well. And I think how science is actually done is, um, is being forgotten. And, you know, I, I, think, I think we are actually literally in a cryptic dark age. Now, every dark age has a small number of people, I call them keepers of the flame, who do remember how to do science and keep that knowledge alive in one way or another. But it's time, uh, it's time to dust it off and bring it out into the mainstream. And, you know, the toolkit for figuring out what a story like this means is not different from the toolkit you use to figure out what's going on in a tropical forest. It's hypothesis testing. And what you don't want, you know, people have heard from me now, they've heard some things, they may be shocked by them. You don't know. This is one person's view of what they saw. What you really want is many people to have seen it, and then you want them to pool their understanding, to point out what doesn't make sense about one story, one explanation, or another. That's the process. And the, the fewer of us who are on the case, the worse we're going to do. And that we should just expect that. So uh, the first answer is just wake up. Something is yeah. afoot that none of us have seen before, even to the extent that there are echoes of historical processes here. Much of this is, is quite new. I mean, for one thing, a mass migration through a dense jungle where people have been informed about how to transit it you know, by cell phone, where money can be wired by Western Union to buy yourself a bus ticket after you've been robbed by bandits in, in the forest, 
All right, this is this is this is some weird combination of very low tech and very high tech. What, what percentage of the migrants have smartphones? Well, I don't know, but I uh, my guess is a lot much larger percentage have them at the beginning of their trek than have them at the end. In part, that's because of rampant theft. Yeah, I talked to a uh, a woman. Her name was Jen. She's Venezuelan. She was a college student in Venezuela and is fleeing the collapse of her society. She was robbed of everything she had Ugh. in Darien. I'm almost certain she was raped. I didn't ask her, um, but I told her that I thought her journey had been more perilous than she shared, and she confirmed that, and I think we both knew what I was talking about. Um, but in any case, she lost her phone. Um, to bandits. But the other thing that happens is the exhaustion that people who are unprepared for the Darien Gap experience in struggling up these just mud doesn't even describe it. The clay in these soils is such that you just imagine incredibly slippery uh, faces, uh, you know, that are being drenched in rain on a daily basis. People are so exhausted. Um, that they rid themselves of the possessions that they thought they would somehow bring through. Um, you know, they they lose their shoes, they drop all of their possessions, and they walk out with nothing. Um, so in any case, I would say probably most of them have phones when they when they embark, and I have no idea what the percentage that actually keeps What is it doing to the environment, to the landscape? Uh, it's a catastrophe. I mean, it's certainly going to be limited at this point to the, I think there are three major routes through the Darien Gap at the moment. They are absolutely littered with um, trash and bodies, and it's apparently uh, quite hellish. In fact, Jen told me that on her trek, um, she spoke pretty good English. She said, that she didn't see a single animal. I'm sure she meant mammal, but the idea of walking across Darien and not seeing a single mammal suggests that this is just absolutely devastating. Now, it's nothing compared to what will happen if a road gets put through. Roads have a very well understood impact on a forest like this. Once you have roads, you're going to have hunters and they're going to empty the forest. You're going to have empty yeah. forest syndrome. After that, you're going to have loggers. They're going to be pulling out all of these priceless tropical hardwoods. You're going to get miners who are going to illegally go in there and mine and leave big tailing piles and toxins. Um, it's, it's a devastating impact. At the moment, my guess would be that um, the forest is rescuable but the process has to stop. If it continues to go down this road, uh, it will be unsavable. Has the government of Panama said anything about this? I mean, it's their territory. Um, mostly they don't say anything. And what we were told was that this was kind of the deal, that if they ushered people through, they facilitated their movement, then those people would keep going. And this is a, a temporary cost for Panama. Um, I think if the people of Panama thought that the migration was going to stop and they were going to have to absorb all of these migrants, uh, there would be riots in the streets. That's my guess. Now, Panama's, for other reasons, in rather uh, perilous situation um, because after the handover, the Panamanians upgraded the canal um, and they did so according to plans that Americans had drawn up. They put in a third lane for boat traffic. But the th so every time a boat transits the canal, a huge amount of water is lost in the process of uh, lifting and, and lowering boats. When the Americans drew up the plans for a third lane, which the Americans did not complete, the Panamanians now have, it involved the damming of a second river to provide more water. So that never happened. Panama is now in a drought, and the drought combined with the massive extra losses of water is resulting in the Panama Canal 
um, having greatly reduced traffic, which is a huge hit to the Panamanian economy because each of the ships that transits the canal uh, hands over a huge pile of cash to be allowed to do it. Um, and this is a major piece of the Panamanian economy. We're at the beginning of the dry season. I don't know what's going to happen by the end of the dry season, but uh, it may go from a greatly reduced number of transits per day to, I don't know, could it go to none? Maybe, which would be a, a big hit to the world economy, actually. This is why the Nicaraguans are considering completing that canal, right? The Nicaraguans, that has been long under discussion for... Oh, 150 years. Yeah, right. So uh, I don't know if the Nicaraguans are going to. At the moment, the Panamanians are using... Uh, the train that parallels the canal and basically lots of ships are offloading their cargo onto a train and it's going uh, overland to a ship on the other side. Um, so in any case, Panama has a stability problem of its own and that combined with uh, the hazard posed by this migration and, you know, if America closes the, the door on this migration, where do these people go? So last question, if you were to, um, I know that you will continue your, your journey of inquiry in, in this topic, but who, where else would you go to get answers to what exactly is happening? Well, if I, if I, was, uh, if I was initiating an effort to figure out that question, I would bring the people who have navigated the story this far together with uh, whatever experts still exist on the various related topics. I mean, frankly, I would talk to Michael Yan about all of the things that are connected to this story, all the things he's seen all over the world. He has a very good sense for who the players are and what he knows has to be brought together with an understanding of um, how these dynamics might play out. But I have to say, I'm not sure, I don't know how much time we have. Again, I don't know if what I saw implies a, uh, another shoe is going to drop. How many of these Chinese sleepwalkers have to end up in the U.S. before some other phase kicks off? I don't know. I know some uh, open-minded people, and I know some rigorously rational people. I know very few who combine those qualities as well as you do, and I just, it was such a pleasure to hear you talk. So, Brett, thank you. Thank you so much, Tucker. Free speech is bigger than any one person or any one organization. Societies are defined by what they will not permit. What we're watching is the total inversion of virtue.